One of my most favorite meals in all the world is also buco, and I've been eating it since I was knee high to a boot in a little Italian restaurant in Seapoint. I'm still cooking it now. This ossoboco is not a very difficult dish to make, but it's definitely worth the cooking time and the effort. And while it's not quite winter yet, when the odd cold day does arise, you'll have this recipe right there at the ready. To make it, you're going to need thick cut veal shin, flour and salt and pepper to brown the meat, onions, celery, carrots and garlic, dry white wine, beef stock and canned tomatoes, tomato paste, bay leaves, sugar, thyme and rosemary. And then we're going to make a creamy parmesan polenta, which is perfect with ossobuco. For that, you're going to need polenta, butter and parmesan. And of course, a traditional gremolata made with garlic, flat leaf parsley and lemon. So because my parents were avid foodies, I literally grew up in restaurants and one of the most sort of popular ones were called Mario's and it was down the road in Greenpoint and we used to eat there every Friday night. And in winter, Mrs. Mario, as we called her, used to whip up these big bowls of ossoboco and just put them on the table for us and sort of eat family style. And it's always been one of my most favorite, favorite, favorite things. And it's incredibly easy to make. So I'm gonna start by just lightly flouring the veal shin and now also put some oil in the pan. And now we're going to just brown the meat. Brown it in batches because otherwise you're going to crowd the pan too much and nothing's really going to brown at all. Right, now, unlike Nick's incredible mirepoix, I'm just going to make an ordinary old sort of, you know, regular sort of homemade one, which means you just haphazardly chop everything in sight and walk away from the problem. So this is the holy trinity. It's onion, carrot and celery. Now. These pieces of celery don't have many leaves, but the leaves are really sort of kind of like that really flavorful bit. And if you've got a long cooking, slow cook dish, a couple of leaves never go amiss. Let's go and turn the veal shin. Now, you want it to be quite decently brown, but I mean sort of not blackened. Don't, you know, get hysterical about it all. The flour helps the browning process um, most definitely, but what it also does is it it helps to sort of add a certain thickness to your stew or your soup or whatever it is at the end of the day. It also adds a bit of extra flavor. So I'm gonna take these out as I go and make room for the next, the next ones. Okay, so just leave those over there to brown. Now, all good things Italian have loads and loads of garlic. You know the drill, the finer the garlic, the stronger the flavor, so it's kind of up to you. So also buco has long been a very famous Milanese dish, um, something they've become very famous for. And it's all about the marrow bones. That's the real sort of, you know, the place where all the deliciousness is and all the unctuousness is and all the everything. And in fact, when you eat with your marrow bone, the spoon, and you sort of get all the inside out, it's called tax collecting. <laughs> Not quite sure why, but I do think it's completely divine. Okay, I'm gonna haul this over here. Because it's all getting quite busy and I think we're ready to start frying. Now what is very important is that you want to use all these delicious meaty pan juices and all the bits of sort of stuck flour at the bottom. Unless you've, of course, you've completely messed things up and it's all burned, in which case you're going to have to start again. But if you haven't done that and you've got all those sort of meaty bits, please keep them because they're just going to add to the flavour. Right, let me just bring this a little bit closer. Throwing carrots all the time. So I think it's not a bad idea to start with the onion and just sort of get that going. And then you'll go with your carrot and your celery. Do remember that you only want to add your garlic at the end. So you just want to give this a good sort of fry to get the flavors going. That's all you're doing. You're not trying to cook anything because it's going to cook for a good few hours, either on top of the stove or in the oven, really up to you. I'm gonna toss the garlic in now. Traditionally speaking, in Milan, this dish is served with um, risotto milanese, which is a risotto that's, that's flavored and colored with saffron. Okay, and now to return the meat to the pan, put it all in there. Oh my goodness gracious me, so fab. A long, long time ago, tomatoes weren't used. It was literally a white sort of dish, white wine and stock and just the veal. But somewhere along the line, when tomatoes got to Europe, tomatoes began to be involved in the dish. I'm just gonna use one and a half can. This is not a tomato stew. There should be an element of tomato, like a sort of a hint of tomato, but certainly not loads and loads of it. A Couple of bay leaves. 
If you've got some fresh ones, how marvellous. If you don't, well, you know, life is short and dry will do fine. Some thyme and a little bit of rosemary. I think some tomato paste. Shove that in there. And where there is tomato and where there is wine, there will most definitely have to be sugar. Now, when I say that, I don't mean you've actually sort of piled the sugar in, but if you've got, you can add acidity of any kind. You need about a cup of wine. Um, then you're going to have to just balance it. So, grab a bit of sugar. I'm going to try and squeeze some beef stock in here. There we go. Some salt and pepper. Lots of that. A good sort of amount of love and sort of food memory stuff tossed in there. So just give it a good stir. It's come to the boil, so turn it right down. Put the lid on and just simmer it for it until it's beautifully tender. Now we're going to start the polenta. So I've got some boiling chicken stock here. You could absolutely use some salted water. It's no problem at all. I've got the polenta. I'm going to just turn it off for a moment so it doesn't all sort of bubble up and erupt out of the pot. And then just whisk it in, just so it sort of introduces it as we go. Get that going. Put it back on, also again, very low. Put the lid on and move away from the problem. Now, you cannot have ossibuckle without gremolata. I'm just grating this garlic, well, because it's got lovely big cloves and it saves me chopping it. It's a lovely lemon. And if you're doing sort of an Asian soup, you could sort of do an Asian-style gremolata, and in which case you would use garlic, maybe a bit of ginger, some coriander and some lime. I think that should do. I must say, in our house, you can never have enough gremolata because everybody seems to want it and eat it and love it. And there we go. And then we're going to get some parsley. So you want to chop it relatively finely. Pop that in there. Little spoon to mix it up. And if you've got lots and lots of people for dinner or lunch, make a couple of bowls, because it does go quite fast, and not having enough gremolata is a sad thing. I'm just going to check on the polenta. Oh, <laughs> comforting food, this. Right, now for the sort of pièce de résistance, because, well, it's nice as is, but it's much better when it's got loads of butter and parmesan. So, lovely. Okay, so just get everything incorporated. If you want to add a little bit more parmesan and taste as you go, I wouldn't blame you. In fact, I'm just going to have a little, just a little taste, quite hot. Mm. This sort of creaminess of this is the perfect foil for that slightly tomatoey, winey sauce of the ossobuco. Mm. Add some gremolata, and um, hopefully Nick will enjoy it as much as I do. The combination of these Italian flavours is simply to die for. Whether it's hot, cold, or somewhere in between, a little bit of delicious comfort always goes a long way. It is truly delicious. Thank you very much. I know my mirror pie wasn't as perfect as yours, you know what I mean? <laughs> this dish definitely requires a more robust... There you go. I knew it all along. <laughs>